good afternoon friends uh, for few it might be good morning or uh, good evening i'm your host piali and uh, i welcome you all to this uh, webinar today we have uh, mr scott ambler uh, with us scott is the senior consulting partner at uh, scott ambler and associates uh, where they help organizations to understand and adopt disciplined agile delivery Apart from that, uh, Scott is a well-known author and a keynote speaker also. He has keynoted at multiple international conferences on disciplined agile delivery, scaling agile, enterprise agile, and uh, enterprise architecture as well. Today's topic, we have a very interesting topic, uh, Choose Your Wow where Scott will tell us how to tailor and evolve our uh, way of working using disciplined agile strategies. So now I would request Scott to start with his presentation and uh, take the show forward. Over to you, Scott. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Um, so thank you everyone, everybody for uh, taking time out of your busy day to attend this, uh, attend this webinar. Okay, so who am I? So as you heard, uh, I've been doing this Agile stuff for a long time. I've, uh, myself, my organization, we help organizations around the world to um, understand this Agile and Lean stuff, often applying it at scale. And um, so anyways, I, uh, and I'm here to share some ideas with you today. So uh, wh what do I want to talk about? I'm, I'm going to do a very brief uh, introduction of the uh, Discipline Agile framework just to sort of set um, you know, sort of set some foundational ideas for us. Um, and then I'm going to jump into the, the actual topic, which is uh, how do you, how do we um, choose our way of working? How do we choose our wow? Um, and then I'll, I'll work through, um, you know, why context counts, um, choosing a, choosing appropriate life cycle, um, why we need a, a hybrid approach and uh, how to choose our practices. So um, one, you know, one idea uh, that I want to get out there right away is um, the, uh, my organization, we tend to look at what um, what people are actually doing in practice. So we don't um, we don't limit ourselves to some of the the agile marketing rhetoric, shall we say? And uh, and certainly we're not purists at all. We're we're more pragmatic. So I'm going to um, I'm going to address some ideas that you might not be familiar with, particularly if you're fairly new to agile. Um, I'm going to be looking at the bigger picture, and um, I'm going to be speaking in terms of what happens at the in, in the enterprise. So what happens in these Fortune 500 companies? Often when we're, we're dealing with some complexities that um, are inconvenient, shall we say, for, uh, for Agile. But they're the realities that we actually face. So the Discipline Agile framework, um, we address, uh, the goal is to address uh, business agility. So it originally started out as uh, Discipline Agile delivery, and that's going to be a, a big part of the, of the topic today. And we like to, uh, we like to use the, uh, the analogy of an engine. And what we've noticed over the years is that the Agile community has gotten very good at building Agile software development teams. We, we really are at the leading edge of that um, from a software engineering point of view. We're um, doing some very interesting things. So we're, we're good at building great teams. We're good at uh, tuning them and tweaking them and getting better productivity out of them, better speed out of them. Um, but what happens is we often take these great Agile teams, these great engines, and we plunk them into our organizational tractor. And we wonder why we don't win the race. So the point is that if you want to win a race, you need a racing car. And this is what DevOps is all about. And um, so how, and how, do we, how do we do DevOps in uh, an organizational setting? So not only do we do you know, the, the figure eight DevOps stuff that we all, all uh, like, but also how do we bring um, DevSecOps, you know, the security stuff into play, database DevOps? How do we bring in biz DevOps? And how does it all fit together? Um, and this is something that um, the DevOps community is still sort of figuring out. Um, we've, we've been dealing with it for a long time now in the Discipline Agile framework. So um, we truly do have a, an enterprise class approach to DevOps in the framework itself. Um, and then, of course, um, that's not the real that's not the real solution either, because, you know, anybody can go and buy a racing car. But you need a you know, if you want to win the, win the race, you actually need somebody who can drive the racing car and you need a pit crew to help you help you run it. So you need a, a discipline agile IT department. And so the idea here is that um, you know, DevOps is great, but it's not sufficient. And we're starting to see that coming out of the DevOps community is that they're now trying to apply DevOps across the entire organization. And they're still sort of figuring it out. But um, we, we, need to, uh, we need to understand um, all of IT and how does all of IT fit together into a coherent whole. Because all we need 
is one aspect of IT. So maybe our HR processes aren't very effective, or maybe our procurement processes aren't very effective, or you know, maybe the, da the, the database stuff isn't working out so well. You know, they're still doing traditional, and everything grinds to a halt. So we need to be agile across the entire IT department. But then, of course, that's not sufficient either, because what we really need is an agile enterprise. We need to have, we need business agility. So um, we need a race. You know, so we need a business that can take our great IT department and actually make money at it. Um, so this is the overall vision of this financial framework, and we go into uh, um, great detail of how all this works. But anyways, um, let's get back on track here. So some of the um, some of the, the fundamental, um, so the, the Dispenager framework is a uh, is based on seven principles, and many of these principles are going to come out in this talk today. So I want to do a brief overview of that. So we our goal is to delight our customers, not just satisfy them, not just meet their needs, but to delight them, and um, and to keep continually delight them because if we don't delight our customers, somebody else will, and they'll steal them away from us. So we need to um, we need to focus on the customer. Um, but we also need to be awesome, and this is a, a strategy that we um, that we've been promoting for years, but uh, has been popularized recently by the modern agile um, community. And so we want awesome people working in awesome teams for an awesome organization. And the only way you can be awesome is you've got to be able to choose the way that you work. You got to be able to choose your wow. We like to say so. This is a, a driving factor, I believe, for all of this. Um, we need to be pragmatic. Um, a big challenge in the Agile community right now is um, too much purism. Um, so you'll, you'll often hear people say, well, that's not in Scrum. That's not Scrum. Or that's not Agile. Um, well, that's not actually the point. Um, we we need to do what's, what's right for our organization. We need to do what's right for our customer. And sometimes that's not so Agile, and that's okay. That's the best we can do, or that's what makes the most sense in the situation that we face. So um, let's actually focus on getting the job done not on being pure. Context counts. Different people, different teams, in different situations will work in different ways. Um, so a team of five people will work differently than a team of 50 people. A team um, spread across the planet will work differently than a team that's co-located. This is blatantly obvious. So this is another reason why we need to allow our teams uh, to choose their wow, to choose the way that they work, because different teams need to work in different ways. So we need choice. So we need to be able to choose from them techniques. We need to be able to choose our life cycle. We need to be able to choose the practices and the strategies the way um, uh, that we're going to do. We're going to need to choose our organization structure as well. So um, there's a lot, uh, a lot of things to choose from. So uh, the this financial framework is focused on giving people choices. You know, letting people know what what they what their choices are and what the trade offs of are of those choices. And we'll see this in a few minutes. Um, we need to optimize flow. We need to optimize flow across the entire process, not just our little part of it. So, um, and this gets back to the, the uh, engine analogy, um, that when we focus just on building great software development teams, that's, that's wonderful. That's, that's a very good thing. But if we don't optimize flow across the entire organization, if we plunk our engine into a tractor, we're still not going to win the race. So we need to look at the bigger picture. Um, we need to take more of a lean approach when it comes to organizational strategy and overall process strategy. And then, of course, we need to be enterprise aware. We need to do what's right for, for the organization, what's right for the customer, not just what's convenient for the team. So in the Agile world, we often, we often become team focused. And we often talk about having whole teams, which is a great idea. And we often talk about um, uh, on, on optimizing for the team. Well that's good for the team, it's very convenient, but it's not actually what we need to do in the organization. So we should be following common conventions and we should be reusing the existing infrastructure. We should be um, paying down technical debt. So we need to, to look at the bigger picture and do what's right um, for the overall company, not just what's convenient. So anyway, so this is the um, very brief overview of, of the uh, Discipline Agile Framework. Um, so why is this important? So what we want to do is enable people, enable teams to tailor their way of working, to, to tailor their wow. And the only way you can, you know, you, so in the Agile world, we like to talk about teams should own their own process. Um, you should be able to choose the way that you work. You should, um, you should strive to evolve it. So you should um, reflect on a regular basis. You should, um, you know, you know, hold the retrospectives and experiment with new techniques and, and figure out what works for you in the situation that you face. Um, so you need to evolve. You know, it's not only do you need to figure out your initial way of working, but you should also improve it over time as you learn. The, so those are great philosophies. 
The challenge though is how can you possibly do this if you don't have if you're not a process expert, if you don't have some sort of process knowledge base? Because because there's hundreds of practices and there's hundreds of agile strategies and, and not so agile strategies out there. Are we all process experts? Are we can we all do this? Do we even know to go look? Do we even know the language to go searching on things? Um, just uh, just last week at the, at the at the big agile conference in the United States, I I, uh, I ran, I facilitated a session on agile architecture, and it was interesting. I had several people come up to me and say, wow, this is great. Finally, somebody's talking about how to do architecture in agile. And the sad thing is this is a, a, a topic that's over 15 years old. Um, and, you know, if you Google agile and architecture, there's a phenomenal amount of information out there. Um, but they hadn't even thought to Google it. Um, or Bing it, you know, depending on your search engine of choice, I guess. But um, uh, so this is a, this is unfortunate that people, you know, you know, some people didn't even think to look or maybe they didn't even have the language and they didn't even know what search terms to look on, uh, look for. Um, so anyway, so we've got a We've got a challenge here. So this idea that we um, so it's great that we want to own our process, that we want to choose our wow. But if you don't know what to what to look for, um, then you got a problem. So you know, it's the equivalent of telling somebody. Um, you know, go out and, and go to the go to the go to the store, or go to the market, and um, get get the ingredients for to make dinner. Um, and you know, here's the here's what we want you here's the dinner that we want you to make. And if they ha if they have no cooking skills, if, or if they've never cooked before, they you know all they've ever done is heat up things in the microwave. Um, then they're overwhelmed. You know, they, you go to the market and you're just overwhelmed with the choices you've got, and you don't even know what spices and what vegetables to pick and and all that sort of stuff, let alone you know, how to put them all together into, in, into something that um, that actually makes sense. Because you know, for those of us who, to, to, who do cooking, we know that you know you can go out and you can buy you know three or four different vegetables and a bunch of different spices, and if you don't know what you're doing with them, it'll be a complete mess. Um, so this is the challenge that we've got. So how do these parts, these process parts, all fit together? You know, which process parts do we need in order to build our process and to build our way of working? So this is this is the answer. You know, this is the question that we're trying to answer. So one one aspect, so one of the principles of discipline agile is that context counts. And the what I'm trying to get at here with this diagram is that different teams are in different situations. So you know, a team of ten people will work differently than a team of a hundred people. A team that's co-located will work differently than a team that's um, spread across you know, several buildings in the same campus, let alone spread across the planet. Uh, a team that is under light critical regulatory compliance will work in a much different manner than a team that has no compliance at all. Um, a team that is dealing with significant technical complexity will work differently than a team that's you know building something very straightforward or is building something on a you know a greenfield application with brand new technologies and they have complete control over the environment they're working in. So different teams are in different situations, so they will work in different ways. So we need to allow them to change, to choose the way that they work, to change, to change up their approach to meet the needs of the situation they find themselves in. And of course, um, there's also this issue of, you know, what is the skill level of the people um, on the team? What is the culture of the people on the team? What are they allowed, organizationally, what are they allowed to do? Um, you know, what are they not allowed to do? You know, there's, you know, many of you work for organizations where there's thing, you know, there, there's techniques that you're just not allowed to do um, because, you know, the rest, you know, the finance department can only work in a certain way or chooses to work in a certain way. Um, the procurement people choose to work in a certain way and you're constrained by that. So, um, it is what it is, but, um, you know, you, you work in your, you know, whatever your environment is, this, this is what you work in. So all of these factors. Um, will affect the way that you tailor your your wow, you, ta you tailor your way of working. So one of the things that we need to do um, on our teams, on our you know, our soft development teams, is to choose a life cycle. So you know many of you work in organizations where you you have some teams doing some sort of scrum based thing, and other teams doing some sort of a lean Kanban based things. Maybe you have some um, uh, product teams or long standing teams that um, are now doing some some form of continuous delivery. You might even be working in an environment where you're working on a brand new product, so you're taking more of an exploratory, lean startup um, type of an approach. So the point is, uh, is that different teams in different situations will follow different life cycles. There's a very good reason to do an agile scrum-based approach, and there's different reasons to take a lean Kanban-based approach, and, and of course, the, these other life cycles as well. So choose the right life cycle for the situation that you find yourself in. 
at having said that, um, from an organizational point of view, we still need to govern these, these teams effectively. So in many organizations, um, you're often prevented from choosing your WOW because senior management um, wants to, you know, wants to force the same governance approach on you, or they, they have this vision of everybody's going to follow the same process. We're going to have a repeatable process, the, the one process to rule them all. So it's sort of like the Lord of the Rings. There's the one ring to rule them all. And that's a wonderful idea from a, uh, for the bureaucrats. But unfortunately, um, it, when you force the same way of working on everybody, um, that way of working will only will um, will only work in some situations. So a, a, you know, a process that works very well for a small co-located team will be a disaster for a large um, geographically distributed team. Um, we inherently know this as professionals. So the point is that we need to be able to um, allow teams to choose their way, to choose their way of working. But at the same time, at the organizational level, we need to govern consistently. So keep that in mind. I'm going to work through these five life cycles very quickly, and then I'm going to show you how to govern them. So even though these teams work in very different ways, we can still govern them consistently. Um, the implication being that your organization does not have to inflict a repeatable, the same repeatable process in all the teams. So this is our, um, this is our um, Scrum-based Agile life cycle. So a couple of things I want to point out here. Um, in the Dispin Agile framework, we're not limited to the Scrum terminology. We're also not limited to Scrum thinking. So we're looking at, at a, um, in this case, we're looking at a, a project life cycle for um, that, you know, from beginning to end, how does all this stuff work together? We also realize that because we're in an existing organization that maybe, you know, so long before this project team kicks off, more than likely somebody had some sort of a vision for it. There's some initial funding to get the team going. There's um, uh, you know, roadmaps coming in to guide the team. So then the team gets together, they start doing inception or you know, sprint zero, if you want to use that terminology, to get their act going, to you know, get their act together, get going in the right direction. Then they get into construction. So they do this, you know, they you know, these short sprints or these short iterations. Um, and then finally they release it in production with this transition. Um, phase is all about. And then once they release into production, somebody, maybe the team, uh, maybe the development team has to operate and support this solution once it's in production. So we're looking at the, the full project life cycle for a software delivery or a so solution delivery team um, based on Scrum. Similarly, we have a lean life cycle based on Kanban. So um, this life cycle works in, in you know, various, you know, as you can see, we have um, similar phases. Um, we have uh, along the bottom of the diagram, we see um, similar milestones as well. I'll go back a slide. So um, just trust me on this. We have similar milestones across the life cycles. This is what gives us the um, consistent governance across teams, even though they're doing different things. So this is a Kanban or a lean based project life cycle supported by the Discipline Agile Framework. Um, here we have a lean continuous delivery life cycle. So when you allow a team to stay together, so you have a, a product team as opposed to a project team. Um, when the teams are allowed to stay together, they tend to improve their processes and they intend it to lean things out. So the inception phase tends to, uh, the sprint zero thing, um, tends to um, uh, disappear over time because, you know, all the get your act together stuff um, no longer needs to occur when the team stays together. Um, so we don't need to initiate a team that already exists, basically. So fairly straightforward. Um, transition also starts to disappear. The, the release process and the deployment process becomes streamlined. We automate it. And so we, you know, what used to be a multi-day or a multi-week transition phase ends up being a multi-minute or multi-hour transition uh, activity. Uh, because we've automated everything. So basically we push the button and it retests and it, you know, deploys in production, you know, continuous delivery, you know, the continuous delivery um, type of mindset. So anyways, um, the, so once again, we have the same basic milestones. Um, in this case, more than likely these milestones are being automated, um, but we still have them for, from, once again, from a governance point of view. Um, similarly, we can take a scrum-based agile approach and still just continuous delivery. So we're a lean team might release into production several times a day. Um, an agile continuous delivery team might release into production once a week. Um, so, you know, they're doing, you're doing a scrum all week long and then Friday afternoon you release into production or maybe, you know, Saturday morning or whatever. So um, that's the basic idea there. So we, you can have a, a, an agile approach to continuous delivery, which is what we're seeing here, or a lean approach to continuous delivery, 
Uh, and it's because you've kept your team together and you've um, allowed them in, to improve the process, to improve their way of working. They've been choosing and tailoring and evolving their wow, and they've allowed to become more effective. Uh, and then finally, of course, you have a, a lean startup type of an approach or a, you know, exploratory, um, you know, get them um, work on uh, minimally viable products, run some experiments and learn from the experiments and then and then figure out what we should build, perhaps using one of the other life cycles. So the point is, is that in disponential delivery or in disponential, I should say, we enable teams to choose their life cycle, which is a major um, part of choosing your wow, choosing your way of working. Um, so we, you know, we let them you know, at, at a macro level, I guess you could say, they choose their wow. Um, and then, um, then the, the next step is at the, at the micro level, can we choose our practices? So um, once, just to sort of wrap up the life cycle section, um, you can choose, you know, teams are allowed to choose their own life cycle and yet still have consistent governance. So we address the issue at the team level for allowing teams to do what's best for the situation they find themselves in. And we, allow, and we also address the issue at the enterprise level of how do we make this work? So when you've got dozens or hundreds of teams in flight, um, you've got to govern them. You've got to you've got to you know, guide them, and um, this is this is critical at the organization level. So this is how um, the disponential framework does this. This I believe this is the only framework that speaks coherently um, to this issue. So for those of you working in large organizations, um, and maybe your management team is struggling with the fundamentals of agile, um, I highly suggest they take a look at this. Um, the next step, um, the next thing is now teams also need to choose their detailed practices. So one of the great things about the agile world or about the you know, process world in general, I guess, is that there's hundreds, if not thousands of great practices out there. The problem is there's hundreds, if not thousands of great practices. So which ones do you choose? How do they fit together? When do you do them? To what extent do you do them? Um, these are abs absolutely critical questions and this is why um, organizations and teams tend to struggle a bit with Agile is because there's this overwhelming amount of choice. Um, although, having said that, do you even know what the choices are? Do your coaches, so we, when you only have a scrum coach, um, do they know anything about um, extreme programming or Agile modeling or Agile data or you know what, what techniques to adopt from the DevOps world or what techniques to adopt from the traditional world or from the unified process or, or many, many other sources? Um, and how do all these techniques fit together? So we need um, a robust knowledge base. We need, um, ideally, we need uh, you know robust people, robust, experienced uh, coaches at least. Um, but you know, failing that, we need a we at least we need coaches that can use some sort of a knowledge base. So, anyways, um, what we're what we've been doing in Dispenagel over the last few years now is identifying these practices, identifying the trade-offs for each practice, because there's no such thing as a best practice. Every, every single practice, every single strategy works in some situations and uh, works well in some situations and is abysmal in some situations. So we need to choose the right technique for the situation that we find ourselves in. So how do you do that? So to address that problem, we've, um, uh, and this is not an easy problem to solve, but we, what we did, or what our solution is, is we suggest that at a high level, teams, uh, you know, a software development team or software delivery team needs to address um, these process, uh, these process goals, these process outcomes. So during inception, um, you know, my team needs to put itself together. We need to work towards a common vision. We need to, um, you know, identify our, our, our architecture structure. Strategy. We need to put together a release, uh, some sort of high-level release plan, do some initial scoping, and so on. Now, the way that my team will address initial scoping will be different than the way your team does it because you're in a different situation. So we will choose our initial scoping wow. We will choose our initial architecture wow, and so on. So we will choose the way that we do these things. So how do we? So at, at a very high level. Um, we have these process, what we call process goals, um, these process outcomes that we need to achieve. Um, that's these, that's the, the bubbles on the outside edge of this uh, mind map. So at a high level, this is great advice, but it doesn't actually drive down to you know, the practice level yet. So how do we do that? So um, this slide is working through, <coughs> excuse me, this slide is working through the notation of a series of diagrams about, uh, about the show that we call goal diagrams. So um, in a goal diagram, one of these process goals, in this case, uh, there's, there's um, 22 
um, process goals on that previous slide, um, three of which are you know, explore the initial scope, form the initial team, and address changing stakeholder needs. Um, so a goal is represented on these diagrams as a rounded rectangle. A decision point or a process issue, I guess you could say, or, or some process thing that we need to think about um, is captured as a uh, square rectangle. So in this case, when we're putting the team together, some of the, the decision points that we have is where are these people coming from? How are we going to evolve the team over time? How big is the team going to be? How complete is the team? Is it whole? Is it just a functional team? How long is this team going to stay around? Um, how distributed is this team? Um, what's the availability of people on this team? So there's a bunch of issues, a bunch of decision points that we need to make as a team in order to choose the way um, that we're, that, you know, in order to, to organize ourselves, to put this team together. Now, for each of these decision points, we have choices. So, for example, when we're geographically distributed, maybe the team is co-located. Maybe the team is uh, a collection of distributed subteams. Maybe we're fully dispersed. So everybody's working from a, a different location. So we, we, we never physically get together. Um, so we have choices. Now, we're not saying in the framework that we've identified all possible choices, but we, have cert we can certainly say we've identified a very good number of choices enough to make you enough to get you thinking enough to first of all let you know you've got choices and enough to um, you know give you give you give you valid options when we have um, when there's an arrow beside this um, list of options that's an indication that the strategies towards the top of the list are more effective than the strategies towards the bottom of the list in general so um, now they're not always ordered like this uh, but um, the implication is is that your team wants to do the best that it can possibly do in the situation that it faces and given the skills that it has. Um, it might not be the best strategy available to them, but it's certainly the best they can do. And wouldn't it be good for them to know that, oh, wait a minute, there's better options available to us. So when we get to, you know, we start doing re retrospectives and we realize that we need to improve this aspect of the way that we work, that we have better choices. Um, and um, because some people don't like to choose, you don't want to, you know, don't want to choose, just want to be told what to do, we have um, what we call default options, and that's geared for a small, reasonably co-located team taking on a reasonably straightforward problem. And, that, and it basically boils down to a combination of Scrum, um, extreme programming, a um, little bit of agile modeling, and a little bit of, of unified process stuff to put it all together. Um, but if that's not your situation, then the default suggestions will not, will probably not work out well for you. Um, and of course, all of these practices, all these strategies um, have trade-offs. So um, we are identifying advantages and disadvantages, and we identify when we want to, uh, when you would want to consider using this practice, and sometimes when you definitely do not want to be doing this practice. So we put things into, con we put these practices into context so that way you can now you can uh, have a better chance of choosing a wow that actually makes sense for you. So we can bring this um, in, in a reasonably lightweight manner. We can bring this process knowledge into your team um, without forcing you to spend years becoming process experts. So um, this is the, the goal diagram for forming the initial team. This is, as you can see, this is a reasonably big one. Um, so the point is, it, so. A um, couple things here. So you've got choices, first of all. Um, another thing is now this diagram is a little bit unusual, where most of these where most of these decision points have ordered choices. Um, usually it's about 50% of them, but um, this just happens to be a situation where most of them are ordered. Um, another thing I want to point out is that sometimes people get um, uh, overwhelmed at this point. They start seeing these diagrams and say, "Oh no, I've got all these choices." Well, yes. Uh, Sorry, what we do, what we do is, as software professionals is complex. Um, we're dealing with inherent complexity um, in, our, in our profession. And in Discipline Agile, we are making that complexity explicit. And uh, we're not covering it up. We're not trying to sell you some, some, marketing, you know, some marketing stuff. Um, so the point is, is yes, it's complex. And so when people get overwhelmed by this complexity, my response is always this. I say, okay, so look at the diagram. So yes, I appreciate it's complex. There's a lot of choices there, but look at the diagram. What decision points would you remove? So when you're putting the team together, are there any things? Are there any decision points there? Those those uh, square rectangles that you wouldn't have to address at least implicitly. Um, now look at your choices. Are, 
Are there any choices there that aren't aren't um, aren't valid choices? Now you might not be able to pull those choices off. Like some of them might not be appropriate for you um, due to level of skill or due to organizational culture. But are any of those choices unreasonable? And the interesting thing is that once people stop for a minute and think about what they're actually looking at, um, the response is almost, well, wait a minute, you missed this, this, and this. So the conversation goes from, wow, this is too complex, I'm overwhelmed, to, oh, wait a minute, it's not complex enough. So um, in some ways, we just can't win. But uh, anyway, so I just wanted to put that idea out there. So don't be overwhelmed by the complexity. Instead, embrace the complexity and also embrace the fact that we have greatly simplified things um, because at least we're making you making you aware of your choices now and this puts you in a significantly better position to choose your well because now you know wait wait a minute I need to think about these issues oh and here are my choice and here here are some potential choices let me you know as a team let's choose our best approach um, for each of these things so it enables you to to increase your chance of success basically um, here's another goal diagram. This is for uh, secure funding. This is uh, one of our simpler diagrams. Um, and just because, you know, this goal, you know, this goal, you know, this process goal has only three decision points because that's the nature of that goal. Um, so here we, you know, we've got, you know, there's different ways we can fund. This is often news to uh, some of our uh, friends in the finance department. Um, so they have choices and some of these choices are better than others. It's interesting that um, sometimes the finance people believe and, they, you know, their religion um, or their belief system tells them that fixed cost is a way is the best way to go when actually it's the, the riskiest thing you could possibly do, um, at least for the IT space. So, you know, and and, uh, and like I said, in behind all this are um, the advantages and disadvantages. So we go into the details of, you know, here's the trade-offs that you're making. Um, a couple times we've seen that the cover from our, our new book that's coming out in October called, you know, Choose Your Wow, um, that book has all of the is basically a, a very large collection of tables when it gets down to it of uh, reference material for, for each of these practices each of these strategies here here's what it is and here's your advantages and disadvantages so that way you can choose intelligently um, here's another example this is um, for the construction goal of changing uh, pressing changing stakeholder needs um, so uh, a couple interesting points here it's a little more complex than uh, uh, some of the things that were often talked about that some of the methodologies often talk about so for example um, scrum has made some choices for here for you um, you know you know in scrum we have this product backlog this work item list um, we you know, prioritize in a certain way we have the product owner doing the product um, the prioritization. So they have made choice. so the methodologies um, like Scrum and like Safe and like Less and other other options, which are and they're all, all these are these are all great methods. They've made they prescribed choices for you. They've made the choices for you. Um, and and in many times they don't even let you know you've got choices. They just say this is the way it's done in Scrum or this is the way it's done in Safe. Um, fine. Um, it, you know, it's, it's easier in a way, it's easier to get started with that. But what happens if those choices are not what makes the most sense for your situation? What do you do? You've got to choose, you've got to, you've got to, you know, you got to evolve your wow somehow. So you got to um, be able to think outside of the scrum box or the less box or the safe box. Um, and that's very hard to do when there's not really any guidance other than, well, hold a retrospective and figure it out for yourself. Um, that's easier said than done, as we all know. Um, this is the goal. Di uh, another constru construction goal diagram. This is for uh, producing a potentially consumable solution. Um, in DA, we talk about um, consumable solutions, not just shippable software. So it's a little, a little more advanced, a little more, a little more mature. Um, so this is where some of the, the programming techniques and some of the uh, just-in-time analysis and just-in-time design techniques are. Um, doc as you can see, documentation's in there as well. Um, this is the uh, a goal, uh, one of the, another construction goal, if you can tell by the color, um, accelerate value delivery. So this is um, some of the um, strategies for supporting um, the construction effort. So how do we how do we plan deployment? How do we manage our assets? Are we, are we doing SCM? Are we just doing version control? Um, how do we um, test? How do we go about reviewing things? Um, do we have to maintain traceability? If so, how can we do it? Um, this is a lot of the um, not as fun um, um, construction techniques, shall you say? Shall we say? So, any but all all very clearly important. Um, and there and once again, there's all trade. You know, there's options. There's trade-offs behind all the options. So choose intelligently. 
Um, at the so that you know that was all um, software development stuff. Um, but at the organization level, um, the release of, yeah, at the organization level, um, how do we share, how do we improve as an organization? How do we become a learning organization? How do we share across teams? So um, one of the process blades, one of the process areas in the disponential framework is continuous improvement. So, you know, what are you know, strategies like, um, you know, coaching and mentoring and holding um, hackathons and open spaces and having, you um, Communities of excellence and all this just stuff. How do we um, how do we uh, how do we do that um, as an as an organization? So how do we share across teams and and get it going? Because it's not just a team based um, process improvement. Choosing your wow um, is not just a team based, not just for teams. It's for the organization as a whole. And we should share our learnings um, across teams. Um, this is um, uh, here's another, an example of another goal diagram. Um, this is one of the bigger ones. Um, this in this case for people management, our version of eight. HR. So how does an HR department work in an agile manner? How does it support agile teams? How does it support an agile organization? Um, once again, we've got choices. So um, instead of forcing the HR people to figure it out on their own and sort of stumble through all this, um, which is what the vast majority of organizations are doing right now, we can instead help, um, help these organizations, help these people, help these HR departments um, move into more of an agile people management type of a mindset as opposed to a traditional HR mindset absolutely critical to our success as an organization. Um, so just to start wrapping up here, um, not only do we have to um, choose our initial wow, so when a team um, first starts, when we uh, initiate, um, when we initiate a team, we need to, you know, the team should choose a way, you know, choose its life cycle and choose, you know, choose some of its initial practices. But over time, we learn. Um, this is one of the reasons why we reflect while we hold retrospectives. We'll identify potential problems that we're running into, and um, we can use the, the DA knowledge base, um, you know, this, this upcoming book called Choose Your Wow, um, to identify potential strategies. So we can use these goal diagrams to say, hey, you know, we're, you know when we're, you know, when we're um, addressing changing stakeholder needs, we're dealing with this issue, you know, we're dealing um, you know, with this with this issue here, like you know, um, we're struggling with who to prioritize because we don't don't have access to a product owner, a product owner's not showing up, or you know, whatever challenge is. Oh, wait a minute, there's six different options here, um, only one of which was a product owner. Um, why don't we try one of these other techniques, um, and maybe that will work better for us than this uh, product owner is not doing their job. So, anyways, um, there's different, you know, so we have choices, so we can identify a a likely candidate. Um, practice to experiment with, and then we can experiment with it for a, a few sprints to see if it actually works well for us. So we can make more intelligent choices um, because we have a better understanding of what these choices are. We can choose our wow, and we can evolve our wow over time. Um, an implication of this is that we also evolve our life cycle over time. So earlier I was talking about how if we keep our teams together, so say we have a, a team that starts with the agile scrum based life cycle. Well, it's it's common for those teams, if, you, if they actually do retrospectives, if they actually reflect and they actually try to improve their wow, then the life cycle itself will evolve. So maybe they start adopting more lean ways of working. Um, maybe they start adopting more um, continuous integration, continuous deployment type practices, and um, they shorten their sprints and they eventually evolve into a continuous delivery type of life cycle. So over time, particularly when you allow your teams to stay together, um, regardless of what your starting point was, you will actually evolve your wow, you can evolve your life cycle into something that works in a more effective manner. This is a very common thing to see in teams, and this is actually what um, Angelus has been talking about for 15, 20 years now, um, is to allow teams to stay together and to, to actually learn and to improve and get better. So let's make it as easy as possible. So just to wrap up here before we go to questions, um, context counts. Every team is unique. Every team faces a unique situation. So they need to have um, their own unique wow. We need Our organizations need to allow, they need to enable teams to choose their way of working. Um, but to do that, you need to know what your choices are. So, you know, the, you know, earlier I was using the analogy of, you know, it's, you know, it's easy, you know, right now the agile community is, has basically gone, you know, for the most part, we go out there and we say, okay, choose your own process. You know, you own your own process. You're really smart. You can figure it out. Um, yeah, which is great. Okay, fine. But this is, this is the equivalent of, you know, telling somebody with no cooking skills whatsoever, 
go to the market, buy a bunch of ingredients, put them together and, and make a really good meal tonight. Um, it, no, <laughs> you need some basic skills. You need to know what the ingredients are. You need to go with the shop, shop for, you need to know how to put it together. You need to know how to cut things and need to, you know, fit, fit things together and when to throw what, what into the pot and what spices to use and, and all this sort of stuff. It, there's a little more to it than that. Um, and I would argue that, that software development is probably a little more complex than making dinner. So if we can't make, just tell people to figure it out on your own and, and make dinner on your own. And yeah, you, you know, you can struggle through like without a doubt, you know, people can go to the market and, and run a lot of experiments and, you know, teach themselves to cook. This is definitely a possible thing. Um, but it wouldn't it be nice to have, you know, you know, have, have help from somebody knows that they're talking about to guide you and to get you going. Um, and this is what we're talking about in uh, DA. You know, let's up our game. Let's make it easier for people to you know, choose their wow, to choose their, in this case, become a better chef. Um, and we need to be pragmatic. Um, there's a lot of great ideas in the Agile Link community, but you know what? There's a lot of great ideas um, from coming from the traditionalists as well and from other sources. So let's show a little humility and respect the fact that the traditional community did in fact build a lot of really great systems in their day. And they did in fact know, you know have some great ideas and um, um, they did know what they were doing. So yes, they could have been more effective, but certainly um, they figured out a lot of really good things. So let's take the nuggets and uh, adopt the, adopt the uh, things that make sense. Okay, so anyways, um, let's go to questions. Uh, yes, just uh, let me check the question box if we have any questions there. Yeah, the first question I can see here, uh, what method suits the team uh, which works on both enhancements and uh, production bug fixes? Yeah, good question. So um, this is where the life cycles are important. So for example, um, Scrum works very well for new development and for um, in situations where the the requirements really aren't changing all that quickly. I mean, it'll change over time, but certainly not that quickly. Um, but when you're in a position where you're doing uh, bug fixes or enhancements, um, particularly on a system that's um, popular, um, these these change you'd be doing is one of the lean Kanban based life cycles. So this is why DA gives you choices. Um, you know, choose the right life cycle for the situation that you find yourself in. Scrum does not fit in all situations. Um, lean, lean Kanban does not fit in all situations. So depending on the situation you face, choose the right life cycle and then tailor it from there um, based on, you know, the details of what you actually face. So choose, the, so choose the right life cycle would be the answer to that and the first step in that to answer that question. Okay, so moving on to the next question. Next, we have uh, uh, how to ensure that you are actually following the agile practice. Uh, how perfect is that? Yeah, so I would argue that um, that that doesn't pass the who cares test with me. Um, I don't care if you're agile. I care if you're doing the best you can in the situation that you face. So the now, what you want to do, though, is it does make sense to measure your effectiveness to, you know, so if we're, if we're adopting a new practice, um, I want to be taking, you know, I want to give the team enough time to learn the practice and try it out and see if it works for them. But I also want to be measuring somehow. So if I'm adopting a new practice in order to improve quality or improve time to market or improve stakeholder satisfaction, you know, whatever my motivation is, um, I want to be measuring that in order to make sure, you know, did adopting this this new agile practice or this new lean practice, did it improve what I wanted to improve? Because if it did, great, let's do it. If it didn't, then I would, you know, I would step back and I reflect again and, you know, maybe we're not doing the practice right. Maybe that practice, maybe it's a good practice, just not for the situation. Maybe we don't have the, enough skills yet to pull it off. Um, maybe we don't have organizational support to pull it off. Like whatever the reason is, I would want to identify it and then address that address that issue so um yeah I'm, I'm not that concerned that you know are you perfectly following the practice i'm more concerned with are we getting the results that we're looking for um, that's what i would rather focus on okay uh, next we have uh, what do you think is the biggest challenge in sustaining agile maturity in an organization and uh, how does that help here 
Yeah, uh, that's a um, that's a big question. Um, so I think the so the real, you know, so once again, you want to have a measurement program in place. Um, I'm, I'm a firm believer in um, as you know, from, from my previous answer in making sure that you're addressing whatever goals, you know, whatever goals, whatever aims you've got. So, um, and there's different different strategies for doing that. You can you know, take the OKR approach. You can take, um, I find that goal, the, the goal question metric approach tends to be a little more sophisticated, but whatever works for you. And so, the, and the idea is that you know, what 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 needles are you trying to you know, are you trying to improve? Like what you know, what are you trying to improve? And then uh, have measures against that. To let you know whether or not you're improving, so I'm not that worried about agile maturity. I'm more worried about are we how effective are we and are we improving? Um, that is it is probably you know um, even more critical. So yes, you know whatever you know. You know I hope we're doing the best we can we can do right now, but I want to also see evidence that we are improving things that we're we're learning and we're getting better as an organization over time. Um, now having said all that, um, the that's easy to say. The challenge, though, is that our organization is a complex. What's called a complex adaptive system. It's a team. Of, it's basically a team of teams that interact together in order to um, hopefully delight our customers. So all of these teams have their own wow, their own way of working. So my team, and so my team has its way of working. Your team has its way of working. Our two teams interact with each other. We collaborate in order to get the job done. So our teams aren't always whole. They're they're actually. You know, the whole team concept is sort of a, is is one of those um, you know myths or uh, myths in, in the uh, agile community. Great idea, but um, doesn't actually work out that way. Um, so my team needs help to get the job done. So we have to interact with other teams to do that, um, which is fine. So my team affects the way your team works, and vice versa. We learn from each other. So um, the implication here is that my team will have its set of metrics. So we're trying to improve whatever we're trying to improve. Your team will have your set of metrics. So similarly. And there might be organization level metrics that all this stuff rolls up to because at the organization level we're trying to, you know, do some sort of uh, improvements. Um, so this is fairly complex. And um, but this is this is this is the case. So we should be measuring, we should be trying to improve, and we should be flexible enough to realize that different teams or different different collection of metrics because we're all dealing with different issues. Um, so our, our metrics wow also is unique and within our team. Okay, moving on to the next one. Uh, next is how is the funding managed for the agile projects where the ways of working uh, will change? Yes, um, that the implication is is our finance people need to be flexible. Um, same with our enterprise architecture people, our operations people, and so on. So the way that it makes the most sense to fund my team might be doing a fixed price thing. Whereas the best way to fund your team, or the best way that you can operate, is more of a time materials type of approach. Whereas another team might be doing uh, a cost plus type of approach. So if you remember back, um, I'm not going to go back. I will go back this slide right now. Um, if you go, yeah. So here we are at the secure funding slide. Um, so the point here is that yes, um, my team will be funded one way. Your team might be funded another way. So the implication being that the finance people. Um, need to be flexible enough to support multiple ways of um, financing teams because the goal and, and, and so this is this is the frustrating thing if we have a repeatable process at the financial level so if we fund all teams using a stage gate approach for whatever reason um, that's convenient for the funding that that's convenient for the finance people um, but um, what's happening is you're inflicting a single way uh, you're inflicting a single process on all of these teams so that it's convenient for, for the finance people, but what happens is it's injecting risk into the teams that are being funded because stage gate funding will make sense for some teams. Okay, that's great, but it will be a mess for other teams. So this is the problem with this repeatable co process concept is that it's convenient for the it's convenient for some people, um, but it's very it, but it's, it actually doesn't get the job pro properly done. So if your goal I would hope that your aim as an organization is to be effective as possible and to be um, to streamline your processes and to um, to do the best you can in the situation that you face, and that requires flexibility. Um, so don't do not inflict one way of funding uh, across your teams because it won't make sense for a lot of them. I mean, you, and you actually increase the risk 
um, to those teams. So, um, so the answer is be, be flexible. So if you're working in, a, in an area like, like, you know, like finance or like procurement or like enterprise architecture that interacts with multiple teams, the implication is, is that you need to be sufficiently skilled and sufficiently flexible to work in a manner with each of those teams that makes sense for that team. This is the way you're going to serve those teams well. If you inflict a single process on them, a single way of working on them, um, you will actually increase it. Easy for you, convenient for you, um, very bad for your organization. Um, so this, this is a, a, a new mindset. So when, as your organizations be, become you know, agile, as, they, you know, as you move towards business agility, um, the, you know, the management team, the organization level teams need to become, need to become flexible and need to, uh, need to be skilled enough to uh, enable this. Um, so this is a, a potentially a new organizational strategy for you. Okay, moving on to the next question. Uh, next, we have uh, how do we address the mindset changes for leadership in DAD? Like how to deal with overcoming resistance to a uh, new wow from leadership and teams in a distributed setup? Yeah, um, so they a uh, bunch of bunch of issues there. But um, first of all, you need to coach, educate, and coach management. Um, absolutely critical to your success. If that's not happening. Um, you will probably fail, and this is not a dad thing. This is a just a transformation thing. Um, you need to educate and coach your executives, and uh, just like you have to educate and coach um, the people in the trenches. The you also this issue that when you're distributed, um, you need to adopt a way of working that reflects you know, the the distribution. If you're um, geographically distributed, a geographically distributed team works differently than a, than a team that's not distributed. A team that's organizationally distributed, so maybe you're a, you're working for a company that um, you know you're a service provider to, to another organization. So you need you know both the way of working of the customer needs to reflect the way of working of the service provider, and you have to collaborate together to be effective. Um, so now you so now you've got a multi-organization uh, education and coaching issue, not just a single organization coaching coaching and, and education issue. Um, and yeah, you need it's you know executives are people too. Um, you know that might be you know, it might not seem to be the way, but it is. They're people too. Um, so they need help. They need coaching. They need somebody that can help them um, and evolve their mindset and to get better. And it's not just a mindset thing. So. Um, you know, being agile is, is important, um, but so is doing agile. If you don't know how to do agile, I don't care what your mindset is. Um, you know, so, you know, so for example, my, my daughter is eight years old and her and her friends, they're very agile. They have a very collaborative mindset, very, um, very flexible mindset. Um, they want to work together. They, they're respectful. They have, you know, they're, they are agile. They're very agile. Um, none of them have coding skills. So yeah, I could put together a, an agile team of, of, of you know seven or eight kids that are eight years old and um, they'd be you know they'd, they'd, ha they'd have an agile mindset that would you know um, be way better than the agile mindset of most other you know software development teams that I've ever run into and yet they couldn't produce a thing um, as a team they just don't have the skills they don't know how to do agile um, so yeah so it's, yeah being agile is fine but that's only part of the picture we also need to do agile so um, and this is um, what the you know Certainly, mindset is, is very important, but um, um, our focus here, you know, in, in this effort, when choosing your wow, um, you also, this is all about, well, let's find the right practices. Let's figure out how to do it, do Agile as well. So we need to up our game. Um, and so, you know, there's a, a very interesting challenge in the Agile community right now. Uh, one of the underlying vibes amongst the thought leaders is, is how um, vapid Agile has become and how we've, we've lost a lot of the original intent of um, you know software craftsmanship and good stuff like that, and because there's a lot of teams that are um, you know they're focused on mindset, but they don't, they don't have the skills. I mean, they can get the skills over time and, and without a doubt, but um, they, we need to focus on doing agile as well as being agile. Uh, the next query we have: uh, I'm studying discipline agile framework. My organization will adapt in future. I need an example and understanding about the concept of governance and uh, IT governance. Yeah, so um, we've got a lot of material on, on that. So if you go poking around the, the disponagiledelivery.com site, 
Um, certainly the original uh, book, um, which we're in the process of replacing, so the Choose Your Wow book um, is meant to replace the original uh, Dispenational Delivery book. But um, uh, yes, we have a lot of material uh, on, the, uh, on the site around both team level governance um, as well as organizational IT level governance. And, 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 and just organizational control in general. And the, so the point is, is that good governance should be about motivation and enablement, and enablement. So we should motivate people to do the right thing and then we should make it as easy as possible to do the right thing. I mean, it's interesting. So in Scrum, they often talk about how a Scrum master, you know, one of the, the uh, critical aspects of a Scrum master is they get the team the resources and, uh, that they need and they, they deflect problems and they, they deal with problems to enable the team to um, you know, to actually work. Um, that's effectively, that's one aspect of governance. And um, the, the problem with that, you know, that's a great idea. And the problem is the scrum masters generally don't have the organizational authority to do these things. And they actually have to go and work with others, you know, management in this case, to get, to get actually get that job done. Um, so, um, which is great if management knows they need to do that, need, and they've got the right mindset, they've got the skills, all this sort of stuff. So, you know, similar, you know, back to that the, the previous question we were answering. So, from a, so governance has to be flexible. So many organizations will still have a traditional governance approach based on quality gates and on producing, you know, common artifacts, you know, following common templates. Um, that, for the most part, is just useless bureaucracy. Um, there's almost no risk mitigation, no risk mitigation going on there. Um, it's interesting when you step back. I, I do a lot of work in the government space, and I'll go into organizations that are still doing this quality gate. You know, do, do the, you know, you can be as agile as you want, but you still have to produce the big architecture document or the big requirements document type of a mindset. Um, and all that does is inject risk. Um, that those quality gate, those traditional quality gates, really aren't working. Um, and, and observably aren't working if you choose to, you know, actually um, step back and, and uh, observe what's going on. So what we need to do, what we need is this, uh, a lighter weight um, risk-based approach um, as opposed to a documentation-based approach. So that's a very different mindset for governance. Um, and but this is what, is, but if you, if you read all the, the leadership literature, um, this is basically this is what they're talking about. How leaders. Um, should be leading and, you know, the management type should be leading and, and, and enabling teams to do the right thing. Um, they shouldn't, you know, they shouldn't be telling them what to do. Um, you know, they should be, you know, helping them figure out what to do. So, um, you know, they should be governing effectively be doing agile governance or lean governance, um, depending on the terminology you want to use. Um, so that's, that's what we get at. So this is a complicated topic um, and we've got a lot of material on the web with that, but those are the, the basic underlying principles. Um, but, and, but this is hard work. You're going to have to actively um, educate and coach um, the people doing governance to help them improve the process, help them improve their way of working. Uh, what are the other options for financing except uh, stage gate based financing? Uh, any new methods of financing which are being followed that you can share? Yeah, so what you can see here. Um, there's what um, just for the funding strategies alone. There's six different ones that we've that we've identified that are fairly common. Um, then you know the scope. Yeah, so so it's interesting here. So we have six different ways of fund of funding strategies. Um, the scope of what you're funding. There's four different things there, um, and there's three different ways that we can access the funds. Um, you know you know how much uh, how, you know um, what's your process of getting access to this money basically. So right there, there's what, six times four times three combinations. So what is that, 72? Um, so yeah, 72 combinations, that's not so bad. So I think there's a few choices. That's you know, a lot of choice. Um, is there more? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but certainly 72 is not a bad start. Okay, so one last question and then we wrap up the session. So this one is about certifications. What are the different certifications provided by DAD? And does DAD allow aspirants to attend training sessions in an online mode? Yeah, um, good question. So yes, yeah, so there's um, several um, types of certification. We, we take a... Uh, slightly different approach to certification than others. Um, we're similar to scrum.org actually, in that um, you have to earn the certifications. So um, 
you know, so our, we have for, for practitioners, there's three levels of certification. The first one is certified dispensationalist, and that is basically making sure you've got some basic um, knowledge that you're, you're, you know, basically a novice. Um, is what we're certifying there that you that you have fundamental knowledge about how the, how things work, and that you're um, eager to learn more. Um, the next step is to become a certified dispensational practitioner. So basically, you have to have knowledge, and we, we validate that by a fairly comprehensive uh, test, online test. And uh, to become a C CDAP, you need to have at least two years of experience as of agile experience as well. So you need to you know not only have the knowledge, but you need to have experience. Um, to become a CDAC, a Certified Dispensational Coach, you need to first of all be a CDAP, um, so you need to have the knowledge, plus you need to have at least five years experience now, and hopefully some of that experience is you know, already coaching or already um, you know, teaching, so you're, you're giving back, you're helping people learn, and we need to see some sort of evidence of that. Um, so to become a certified dispensational coach, you need to have at least five years experience. And there's a certified dispensational instructor as well to be, to, to be able to teach this stuff. Um, and to be a CDAI, um, a certified dispensational instructor, you need to be at least a CDAP. Um, so you need to have at least two years experience in what you're teaching. Um, better yet, we really hope that you're a coach who also happens to be an instructor, so have at least five years experience. So we, we want you to earn your certifications, not just buy them. Um, so, so that's what's going on there. So, and then as far as online stuff goes, yes, um, actually, um, Eisenbridge uh, regularly offers a, a, um, an eight hour online virtual workshop, um, taught, I guess roughly once a month. So, um, if you go, um, if you go poking around on the site, you can see that, um, there's some schedule. I believe there's uh, one scheduled in a couple weeks. So, um, I just don't have the exact dates in front of me, but, um, the answer is yes. Um, there is some online training as well. Um, Okay, so yeah, we have come to the end of the session. Thank you all for uh, joining the session today and uh, thanks Scott for this wonderful session. Attending this session will earn you one SU under category A. You will receive one email with the, the details of claiming that SU. And if you have any, any follow up query or question, you can just post in our discussion forum. The forum link you will get in that follow-up email. And whoever is interested in exploring disciplined agile delivery programs further, as Scott said, you can just visit the training section of uh, Eisenbridge website, www.eisenbridge.com. That's the website. And you can get the exact dates and details of the session. So that's all from my side. Uh, thanks again, Scott. And thank you all for joining the session. Bye. Great. Thank you very much.